Hello again guys and welcome back to another Big Al Devlin video We're filming in a slightly different location to normal and the reason for this is because I want maximum light despite it being a very dull day indeed to show off my new uh, piece and added collection to my essentially my HEMA collection um, or my historical weapon collection however this piece is very very special um, and that's because it's an antique so this is a genuine piece that was used as a self-defense, personal defense tool and weapon um, in the, uh, at the period which it was created, which was uh, the period of the Georgian rule within England. It specifically comes from the rule of George III, and it's around about the middle of his reign when it was created. They can't be specific with the exact years, although I do have obviously the certification to prove that it's an antique. Um, this is important, one, because, well, you want your antiques to be recognised as antiques because it adds value. But secondly, in England, in the UK, where I live, um, you cannot possess um, such a thing as this, as you'll see in a minute, without it being over 100 years old. Um, and quite rightfully so as well. Modern productions, the, these things don't have any use other than, unless they're an antique, which is then as a display piece and as a piece of sort of history. The modern replicas have no use other than to hurt people. Okay, so there is a good reason why that law exists. It's annoying, it's a shame, because there are some beautiful pieces that are done under modern times. And if you're responsible, like myself, you should have the right to own and uh, possess such a piece. Maybe not walk, up, walk out in public with it, I agree with that, but you should still be able to own uh, and display such pieces. But there's just no getting around the law in that sense that it's there for a good reason um, because unfortunately there's a lot of irresponsible people out there also as well as, well as responsible. They're the minority, they're the 1%, but they're the 1% that ruin it for everyone else, unfortunately. Okay, so what I have for you, as I say, is a Georgian, King George III, okay, um, sword stick. This is a sword stick, believe it or not. I'm just going to allow you to first of all focus on the aesthetic. So you can see at the top, it's got a, it's a little hard to focus a little bit on it, but it's got a filigree sort of vine pattern on the top of the handle. It's got an inscription on the top, which is no longer readable. Um, and uh, at the end, it has the, the same metal um, on the base, which is reinforced for allowing it to obviously be used as a weight-bearing cane, okay, which is its primary function. This is a walking aid, first and foremost. It's made out of malacca, okay, which is a form of wood, uh, and it was a form of wood that was used to create um, a number of different things, but obviously it's primary, well, not maybe not its primary use, but one of its most major uses is in the use of certain furnitures, uh, but also relatable to this is it is used to create canes for school uh, punishment. For when schools could punish children physically, uh, the canes that they whipped their children with were made out of malacca. And also the canes up to modern day times which are used to flog and whip um, criminals um, as a form of punishment. It doesn't happen in this country, obviously, but in, in some countries I did read that they do have a sort of a punishment where you obviously you get whipped uh, and flogged and that they make those, um, uh, those whips, I suppose you could call them, or those canes um, out of, um, out of Manica. The reason of such is the wood itself is very strong, very durable, uh, it's waterproof and it's also very flexible, hence why it's used in canes for whipping, okay? Um, however, it's also used in canes for walking because of its durability and its waterproof nature. It makes it perfect to go out into the external environment without worrying, oh, I don't want to get my cane wet because it's going to, you know, obviously get damaged. Now, this particular piece, as I say, is from the reign of King George III from the middle part of his reign, which places it roughly around sort of 1965 to 1970. That's the sort of time when this has been sort of the antique dealers and the specialists have sort of dated it around that period, within that five year period. So that means it just about predates 
American independence. In 1776, the, well, it wasn't known as the US back then, it was just a, a British colony, the 13 colonies uh, on, on uh, you know, essentially American soil that were controlled by Britain um, in 1776 revolted and successfully revolted uh, and regained and gained their independence. It was at this point that the forefathers of America then obviously signed the Declaration of Independence from uh, Britain. Okay, um, so this cane sword just predates that point in time by only just a matter of a few years. So really, what I love about this is the history that will go behind it. This is as old as, as modern day USA. It is as old as, well, it's actually slightly older, and it would have been produced as a result in a period of time when British imperialism was really kind of at its peak, you know. Um, what also interests me is that, you know, in its younger years, not only would have this, have, you know, sort of been wielded and used by someone who would have seen, you know, as I say, the loss of America and the American colonies, but would have also um, seen uh, uh, the wars of, uh, against Napoleon Bonaparte, because of course Britain did go to war, war, war with France. And they were war with France at the time, I believe so anyway, my history is not 100% perfect, but around the time of the American independence. And this is why, or they were about to go to war with Napoleon. And this is really why England uh, or Britain as a whole um, didn't really dedicate the kind of troops it could have to fight against the uh, the American revolt at the time. Um, I think that's how really there are two things that won uh, America uh, their independence. First of all, well, maybe three things. First of all, they fought well. They fought hard. They used sort of guerrilla war tactics and used advanced military tactics against the British. The British also had advanced military tactics and they had the numbers and they had the, the firepower, but obviously they're fighting in foreign lands. Um, and that's the, uh, the second thing, really, uh, well, that's still part of the first thing, it's sort of the military logistics of things. Geographically, America was very hard to get to at the time. And so America lost, uh, sorry, Britain lost the war simply because it couldn't resupply troops to America um, efficiently enough um, because of the distance between Britain and America. Secondly, uh, on top of that, I think Britain underestimated America. America has uh, got a very strong sense of patriot patriotism. And at the time, um, the forefathers of America were very intelligent men. And they were, they were believers in their cause. And when you've got that kind of belief, that passion, and you have the firepower uh, and the manpower behind you, you can achieve many great things. And the USA... Um, is a, is a great country and it's founded on this greatness of its sort of creation. Now, the reason I'm going into this history is because really it's the history of this cane also. You're not here for a history lesson. I know you want to see the sword stick. I will be getting it out, promise. I promise. But I wanted to give you the history of what this would have seen or, or the person who, who owned it at the time would have seen and experienced and had a direct part in it. Because, of course, sword sticks are expensive as fuck. Um, especially at the time when it was made, this would have been owned by a member of aristocracy or someone, well, yeah, no, mem uh, it doesn't matter, lower or upper or middle aristocracy. They were a member of the aristocracy, 100%. They would have had some kind of title, they would have had some sort of stately home, and so as a result, an involvement in these wars that I've described. And the third and, and final reason, really, why... Um, um, and uh, Britain lost the war to, to, to America for its independence was because, of course, it had bigger fish to fry. When Napoleon Bonaparte came on the scene, um, French being right next to England, of course, um, it, it was a no-go. You can't lose your homeland, your, your home territory, so to speak. Uh, and so the war in Europe uh, took precedence over the war in America. And so uh, supplying troops, ammunition, munitions and supplies to the, for to the forces that were, were stationed in America just couldn't be done on a long-term basis, not to the level that it required to obviously win the war. Because England could have, Britain could have won the war against America, but it would have taken a huge effort on the, on, on the effort of the empire. And it would have been worth it, um, as I say, had Napoleon not been put, uh, posed a threat. Um, at the time. 
So this then saw then the Napoleonic Wars also um, around the time of its creation and what a time to have seen because they were some of the most brutal wars you could ever imagine and the generals involved some of the most famous generals uh, like uh, um, Wellington, General Wellington um, for England, well Britain and also of course uh, Admiral Nelson himself. These individuals have statues in London dedicated to them because it was such an important period in our history and maintain, maintenance of our own independence also. America may have gained its independence but we could have lost it to France or to the French Empire at the time. Now I'm just going to stand up because this is really hurting my back and I have a bad back at the moment so it's a good thing that I've got my cane with me and that's the good thing about this. This actually can bear the weight of an 18 stone man very easily. It's 42 inches long, so it's a very tall cane. Um, I suppose you get an idea of my own height then as well. You know that I'm not bullshitting you when I say I'm quite a bit over six foot, but, um, or at least a little bit over six foot. But what we do is now we're going to do what, what you really want. You want to see the blade, don't you? And there we go. We have the blade. Now I've opened it in such a manner uh, there are markings on the cane that allow me to work out where it comes from. Um, basically, this is a single edge blade, okay? It's very sharp, so I've got to be very careful, but it is a single edge blade. This is the edge part, obviously with an incredibly deadly point. Down here, you have a flat part to the blade, okay? Um, uh, which is really for really just sheathing it back into the Malacca stick, which you can see there has a hole within it, which is shaped um, differently on one end, one end than the other. And this is where I had a bit of a problem because when I just first opened this, I put it in the wrong way around and it was very hard to get out. Um, and so um, it's a, it is a good blade. It's still very usable. Obviously it's never gonna be used, um, but you can see wear and tear, it has been used. And it's really strange to have a weapon um, or self-defense tool uh, in my collection that 100% has been used to protect its master and most likely kill the person who was attacking that individual. This weapon is a killer. It would have been a killer. It no longer is, now it's in my collection. Um, it's now just something to be admired and looked after. I will clean up the blade as best as I can because it is a little bit dirty, okay? <laughs> Um, and I will do some maintenance work to the stick because you probably can't see it on camera. There's a few cracks in the, in the, in the, in the wood, um, which is just the splitting where it's being glued because essentially what they've done, put the blade on the ground, they've taken two sort of semi-circular um, elements of the wood, glued them together down the middle, and that's what they've done with the handle as well. The handle is very strong though for obvious reasons because it carries a blade. Um, but as the blade's being sort of drawn out and put back in, you do get, you can probably see it there, uh, little bits of the sort of the grain of the, well, the separation of the wood uh, where, it, where it's been glued together, where the glue's worn off. Um, that's kind of gone uh, and it's allowed a few cracks to appear in the wood. That's easily fixed. I'll get a clamp, um, if not tomorrow, in the next few days. And I'll use some glue that is very similar in appearance, if not identical in appearance to the glue that they used. Um, and I'm just, just going to show you how to put it back in. Goes back in nicely. And you can see it's just friction which holds it together. But if I was to draw it again, you can see it comes out. You have to tug it. You definitely have to tug it for it to come out, but it will come out. Okay. Um, and what I'll do is I'll just clean up the blade and the, and the, uh, the shaft of the cane um, a little bit, make it a little bit more presentable, but I don't want to do too much with it. Uh, there's a few other modifications I would like to do, such as adding um, stuff on top of the wood, treatment to the wood, um, just to make it stronger. I might do that, but this is an antique piece, and really, when you have an antique piece, it, you're sort of attained of responsibility of unaltering it as much, little, altering it as little as possible. You do what you have to do to maintain the piece so that it survives another 250 years. It's about 250 years old, this weapon. So another 250 years uh, in this condition. Um, but 
obviously you don't want to alter it to the point where it's no longer an antique as such. Right, I hope you enjoyed the display. Um, I'm very excited about it. Thank you. Bye-bye.